Good evening. My name is Cordelia Moyes. It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening on behalf of the Rector and Vestry of St. James. What an honor to work again with all the energy and vision of Lancaster history. Cemeteries as living legacies is a subject close to my heart as the historian and archivist of St. James. This church sits on one of the most historic acres of Lancaster. Yesterday marked our 279th birthday. Cemeteries and churchyards are sites of interaction for public and personal history, stories within stories of gains and losses. So they are ideal places for living people to ponder not only the past, but their own lives and it, their repair. Here as part of that activity, we recently placed three social history panels on the Orange Street side of this building, which tells something of the joys and sorrows of people who for 279 years called this place their spiritual home. You are welcome to explore our churchyard at your convenience tonight or on any day. It is now with great delight that I look forward to hearing Kate and Jennifer tell us something of their vision and work in turning a rural cemetery into an urban oasis. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cordelia. Um, so I'm Mabel Rosenheck. I'm the Director of Education and Exhibition Planning at Lancaster History. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks so much to Cordelia and to David Peck and to Chris Keeney, who's running the technology, for hosting us here at St. James. I also want to thank the Friends of the Tanger Arboretum, including a couple of the board members who are here this evening, for co-sponsoring the event this evening. For anyone who doesn't know, the Campus of History on President Avenue uh, here in Lancaster is home to Lancaster History, President James Buchanan's Wheatland, and the Tan Louise Tanger Arboretum. The Arboretum is part of our 12-acre property. It has over 100 different tree varieties, and it's maintained with support of the Friends Group, um, as I said, some of whom are here today. It's a really fantastic resource for anybody who lives in the neighborhood or, or, or lives anywhere in the county. I also, as always, want to thank our members. It's your support that allows us to offer programs like this and offer them for free. If you're not already a member, I do encourage you to become one or make a donation on our website. Membership comes with lots of benefits, um, including free admission to Wheatland, the Research Center, and our new exhibit that is opening in November, as well as discounts on other, most other events. And I'll also note that tonight's event lecture is being live streamed and recorded, so if anyone you know is missing it, it'll, it'll be available for them to view sometime next week. So I am thrilled to introduce tonight's speakers. I was here about a few months ago talking with Cordelia about a very different project. And as we were walking through the churchyard, she mentioned that they were interested in promoting the property as a green space and as a resource for a city that, like so many others, has so few natural oases. So when she said this, a light bulb kind of went off in my head. Uh, we are planning our, our next, you know, the, the next six months of our lecture calendar. We were looking for a location for October because our usual space is occupied right now with, with uh, staging for our new exhibit that's opening in November. And I'd also just been asked by the Tanger Arboretum and by Emily Miller, our Director of Communications, to think about what kind of a talk we could do that would bring history together with, uh, with nature and with the environment that would bring together Lancaster history and the Tanger Arboretum. And I was thinking that since this was, talk was going to happen in October, a a, um, something on the history of cemeteries as green spaces would really be fantastic. So the topic and the venue came together perfectly. Now I just had to find the right speakers. As a former Philadelphian, I moved here about a year and a half ago, I thought about all of the cemeteries in that city and their rich histories, as well as all of the others throughout southeastern Pennsylvania. Some of you may be familiar with Laurel Hill, which dates back to 1836 in Philadelphia, and the Woodlands, which was founded in 1840. But I decided to spotlight Mount Moriah in part because I love it so much, and I think you guys will learn about how fantastic it is this evening and hopefully go visit. visit. And I picked this in part, again, in part because I love it, in part because it's lesser known, and also because I think it's really innovating in its work as a historic site and an arboretum and a community resource. And cemeteries are remarkable community resources, if only because they are free public spaces of which we have so few. So I think we can learn a lot from what they're doing, and I hope you all will go visit them the next time you're in Philly, and of course visit the St. James Churchyard whenever you're, in whenever you're downtown. 
So with that, I'll introduce to you tonight's speakers. Kate Benesek is an assistant professor of instruction at Temple University. She teaches undergraduate and graduate level landscape architecture design studio courses as a full-time faculty member in the Department of Architecture and Environmental Design. Kate is originally from Oak Park, Illinois and grew up in Chicagoland. After completing a BA in history at Boston University, Kate went on to receive a Master of Arts degree in landscape design at the Conway School and a Master of Landscape Architecture degree at Cornell. Jennifer O'Donnell is a taphophile, so I had to look up what that meant too. It's a person who was interested in cemeteries, funerals, and gravestones. Uh, she's a taphophile with a love of genealogy and historic preservation. She's been a board member of the Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery for a decade and was elected president in 2023 after previously serving terms as secretary and vice president. Jen manages all aspects of communications for the Friends, serves on the events committee, and has an intimate knowledge of Mount Moriah Cemetery's records. She's also an avid contributor on findagrave.com and has taken over 150,000 photos that document graves in multiple states. Professionally, Jen has spent over 20 years working at Haverford College as the Director of Web Communications, and she's also a graduate of Drexel University. So with that, I will hand it over to the speakers, and then at the end, we'll have some, some time for Q&A, and I'll be back to, to walk around and, answer, and uh, have you ask your questions. Thank you, Mabel, very much. I appreciate it. I'll just take a couple of moments here to set up so that we're making sure we're keeping time. We're trying to keep this talk to about 40 minutes or so so that we have plenty of time to answer any questions that you all might have. Um, I'll go ahead and start that. And I think we are looking for our slides. But before we do we that, go. I can do a little bit of a further introduction to my own um, history with Mount Moriah Cemetery. Um, as Mabel noted, I am an assistant professor at Temple University. And about 10 years ago or so, I was taking a historic preservation course at Cornell University in which we had to emulate a cultural landscape report for a, a place. At that point, I had met someone who has become very special to me, my current husband, who is from Philadelphia. And that person, Logan, Axelson um, shared with me this place, Mount Moriah Cemetery, and said, you might want to look into it if you're interested in, in cemetery history, which I very much was. So I, I made some connections with the, the president of the board at that point, Paulette Roan, who you'll hear more about as this talk continues. And it unlocked my entrance into um, academia to a certain extent, uh, teaching at Temple University, but also really unlocked my connections to Philadelphia right as I moved moved there in 2014. I, when I was approached about doing this talk, I, I was very pleased to say yes and very excited to do so, but I really couldn't do so without Jennifer O'Donnell, Jen, my friend, and the president of the Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery. Jen, with that, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit. Thanks. Um, also, to give everybody a, a bit of an idea of what brought me to Mount Moriah Cemetery for the first time, it was an old black and white photo I found in my father-in-law's garage um, on the floor in a ripped Macy's bag. And it was a picture of a woman standing in front of a tall obelisk in a cemetery. And because I'm interested in genealogy, I was determined to figure out where this headstone was, who the person was interred there, and of course, who the person was standing in front of the monument. And I figured out over the course of a couple years that this monument was at Mount Moriah Cemetery and that a pretty distant ancestor of my husband's was buried there. And in 2012, I contacted the Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery, which had formed not a year prior, and asked them if they could provide me some information. And they said, we know exactly where that monument is. You should come visit the cemetery and join us at a meeting. And that is probably an example of how everybody gets involved volunteering at Mount Moriah. It's not necessarily that you have uh, an immediate family member buried there, but you go to visit for the first time and you're drawn in. And we hope to share some of that, some of those aspects of what draws people into this place as, as we talk with you about Mount Moriah Cemetery today. Yes, and, and this will be a, a visual presentation, so we'll direct you to the screen that you're seeing at, at my, my um, left over here. And we are going to talk to you about the history of Mount Moriah Cemetery, its incorporation, we'll orient you to this um, 
multifaceted space. So we will talk about it in the context of a, being a rural cemetery, and then we'll talk about the ways in which through programming and various practices have really, in, in our opinion, turned it into what it has been all along, um, but something that we are happy to promote and share and be recognized for, which is the fact that it is an urban green oasis. I, as an undergraduate, was trained in history, and I'm very thankful that I was. It illuminates my own discipline of landscape architecture quite a bit, but I will share that my academic connection to Mount Moriah is primarily through thinking about green stewardship practices, volunteerism, and, and thinking about maintenance and maintenance practices that involve volunteerism. So as I, you know, I'm, I'm relying on Jen a little bit um, for her expertise on the history, but through this talk, as we make our way through, we'll give you some examples of these projects and, and talk about where we are today. But before we talk about where we are today in terms of projects and programming, we should talk about where Mount Moriah Cemetery is. And Jen, I think I might grab that from yep. you just to highlight a couple of things on the screen. So you might be familiar with the general outline of the city of Philadelphia there, um, Camden, New Jersey, across the Delaware River. Mount Moriah is right here. It is a not insignificant, insignificant patch of green space that you can see from a far, far above. Um, over 200 acres, it's what we would think of in terms of urban ecology as being a node, an important patch of green space, not only for use by the public and communities and Philadelphians and people vis visiting from around the region and around the country, but it is definitely um, a significant space that's kind of half in Philadelphia County, it is half in Philadelphia County, and half in Yaden, um, which is in Delaware County. Um, across Cobbs Creek. You can get a sense of Cobbs Creek and we'll advance and show you a little bit more of that in just a moment, but that green corridor that you see right there is the path of Cobbs Creek itself, which is bisecting Mount Moriah Cemetery. We're about, gosh, a little over seven miles from Laurel Hill, which is a well-known rural cemetery, incorporated right around 1830 or so. And then the Woodlands as well, oh, no, the Woodlands might be 1830, I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. And the Woodlands is about um, maybe 1840 and about two or so miles away from Mount Moriah. So we're part of a greater network and community of rural cemeteries. We're part of a green space network. And I will also note that we're in a corridor down here in southwestern Philadelphia that includes a, a major wildlife refuge, which you can get a sense of the sizing there. Mount Moriah is it's somewhat comparable in terms of taking up a significant amount of naturalized green space. Here we go. So there are three creeks that come into play, and thank you for indulging me as I talk about the ecology, which is something that's incredibly important to Mount Moriah. We've got Cobbs Creek, again, bisecting the cemetery. Darby Creek, not that far away, kind of getting closer to your neighborhood, Jen. And it's the Schuylkill River. And we also have two cemeteries that even from above look significantly different from Mount Moriah Cemetery. You can see that here. Fernwood Cemetery, Holy Cross Cemetery. You can see the kind of grid-like nature of the pathways that are very clear and very traversable, both on foot and also by car. The kind of lawn cemetery layout, you can see it dotted with, I'm sure, beautiful canopy trees. But you see Mount Moriah at this, you know, many tens of thousands of feet, and you can see the, the, the densely wooded character of it and start to get a sense that there are areas that are very heavily wooded, very heavily naturalized, and also areas that have been cleared as well. And to take an even closer look at the cemetery, we go. This is what you see. So Jen, I am going to kind of throw it over to you in one moment, but you can see Cobbs Creek running through here. And just to orient you, this is in Philadelphia. This is um, King Sessing Avenue. And this area on the other side of Cobbs Creek is in Yaden Borough, which is in Delaware County. Take that. Sure. Thanks. Um, so this, um, map overlay is all of the sections of the cemetery oriented on a Google Earth view. And you can see um, sort of to the right side of the screen, there are some sections that have um, a letter 
instead of a number, we refer to those as the alpha sections. That is a section of the cemetery that was added around 1908, 1909. So it was not a part of the original footprint of the cemetery. Um, we'll talk a bit more later about the entrance, but this corner here, which is the corner of King Sessing and the aptly named Cemetery Ave, is where the original entrance to the cemetery was. And we'll talk a bit about the, the gatehouse a bit later on. You can see that there are, on the Philadelphia side, um, two large circular sections. One of those, um, the one that is over here, is referred to as the Circle of St. John. It is the highest point on the Philadelphia side of the cemetery, um, and that is a Masonic section, and it was a built section, so it is not um, original. The, the highest point in the cemetery. It was built up in order to be the highest point in the cemetery. And you can see um, the Philadelphia skyline from that area. Uh, as Kate mentioned, the cemetery itself is just under 200 acres. We don't have an exact number of burials at Mount Moriah, but we believe it to be at least 200,000 individuals, if not a bit more, based on the records that have been um, recovered. I think before we advance yep. this slide too, Jen, I would just jump in and say that this is a very a helpful photograph to get a sense of the density of the residential neighborhoods that mm. are surrounding the cemetery. On the Yaden borough side, um, there's more of a, a much more of a wooded buffer that exists there between the cemetery and the surrounding neighborhoods. And we have some subsequent slides that will illustrate this um, much more clearly. But there is a parkway, Cobbs Creek Parkway, which is a, a very high speed, very difficult to cross roadway um, that bisects the cemetery alongside Cobbs Creek. So both of those um, edges have a, a significant impact on the cemetery as a whole. Um, so I mentioned those alpha sections that were added to the cemetery footprint in about 1908, 1909. Um, at that point, the Mount Moriah Cemetery Association, the owner of, of the property, um, built a brick office building and a new entryway. The Friends of Mount Moriah have recently finished uh, renovating the ground floor of that office building to use as a meeting space and for storage. Um, the building had not been used since 2011, and so stood empty um, and, and unused for the last decade or so. And so we've replaced the roof and redone all of the plumbing and, and electricity and, and all of that sort of um, maintenance work. So we're beginning to actively use that space again. It's important to note along King Sessing Avenue, there is a trolley that runs down the middle of the street and you can sort of see the, the trolley tracks here. That trolley was actually used when the cemetery was established to bring funerals and bring the body to the cemetery from the central part of the city. They had special funeral cars that would bring the funeral procession from the central part of the city um, to Mount Moriah. And you can see, um, we're gonna talk a bit about what happened at this cemetery and its abandonment and disrepair, but you can see in this um, picture the type of thing um, that we were dealing with when we arrived, that there were sections of the gate missing and the fence line missing and, and that sort of thing. Um, let me just see if I can. On the Cobbs Creek side of the cemetery, Kate mentioned that the Cobbs Creek Parkway bisects the cemetery. That road was not there in 1855 when Mount Moriah was established. There was a creek there, of course, but no roadway. Um, around 1900 or so, the city of Philadelphia decided they wanted to put in this road, which is actually a state highway. Um, it is a two-lane road, but it is a state highway. The cemetery uh, owners tried to fight having a roadway built through the cemetery, and obviously they, they lost. So there is now a roadway there. In more recent years, there's been a um, wide paved trail added, which is part of the Cobbs Creek Trail Network, which connects into the larger Fairmount Park system. Um, and it is a recreation trail used by people to walk, jog, ride their bikes, um, enjoy the, the space coming through the city. So it's a multi-use trail. 
Before you advance from here, Jen, I would say that people are absolutely recreating, walking, biking, um, jogging along the, the trail, and cars are speeding. They go really, really quickly. They, they could care less if you're trying to cross the street. So there's no official crosswalk there. Um, it can be quite challenging. Um, it can be challenging for volunteer events, for example. But I, I did want to just make a note that as recently as this, this past Saturday, um, partnering with the Cobbs Creek Trail Partners in Villanova University. Um, a group of us focused on removing trash and debris from Cobbs Creek, which with access points really right here from what you see on the screen. A lot of broken glass, a lot of bottles, shopping carts, computers that have been tossed, clothing, um, tons of plastic bags, things that really get swept up by the creek in a major storm event that might stay there for a very, very long time. This is an urbanized stream. It gets really flashy. The base flow is very, very low. It's quite shallow. It is shaded, which is a nice thing. That's what our, our streams want to be generally in this area. Um, but it, it presents, presents challenges in terms of ecological health. And we really do rely on students and other volunteers to help us with these parts of the cemetery, which we consider restoration too, in addition to restoring access to grave sites, as you will see. Oh yes, yeah, site, site topography. Let's get this up on the screen. So there is a total of about 60 feet or so of total topographic change at the cemetery. What does that mean? From high point to low point, you've got 60 feet with your lowest points along Cobbs Creek and your highest points as noted by Jen at this constructed circle of St. John. What was originally here um, before the cemetery was incorporated was quite beautiful. You're in a, a creek valley, um, but it was made even more majestic and even more fantastic by the creation of that high point. So if you were to visit Mount Moriah Cemetery, and we encourage you all to do so, you can take quite a hike to get up and around this place. And there are accessible footpaths. There are some areas that are very hard to traverse and are inaccessible, but many pathways are maintained. And you will see people coming to Mount Moriah on a regular basis, taking a walk, taking a hike, walking a dog, um, recreating to this day within the cemetery itself, even outside of those trails. There we go. And actually, this, this presents a bit of a, a helpful picture to get a sense of what some of these you know, high points and low points might look like and what some of the views are within the cemetery itself. You can see the extent to which there are some paths that are paved to varying degrees. You've got very tall canopy trees, oak trees in this case, and Cobbs Creek is running right down in that location that I'm signaling on the screen right now. You can also see from the highest points the cemetery from the Circle of St. John. You can see the Philadelphia skyline. And some of these images are helpful to get a sense of how some areas are clear and maintained as lawn cemetery effectively. But we also have many kind of shrubby and scrubby areas, especially on slopes, which we have many of at Mount Moriah, because they're very hard to maintain and mow. And we've made a decision to kind of leave those intact, um, removing invasive species when and where we can. But from, to my mind and many of our minds, this also, this is habitat and place for people to engage, but it is also critical urban habitat for wildlife. And keeping those scrubby areas for birds and other mammals and, and otherwise is very important. So this is a, a couple of pictures of King Sessing neighborhood developments. Again, um, we are in Southwest Philadelphia. From 1808, I'm just going to point out the, the site that would become Mount Moriah Cemetery right around this bend in Cobbs Creek. By 1855, Philadelphia is becoming incorporated. You can still see that creek. It's the, the, the edge. It's the you know, southwesternmost edge that we are seeing here. And importantly, 1855 was the year that the cemetery was incorporated. We actually um, have, and I'll, I'll throw this over to you in a moment, Jen, um, 
a newspaper article from the Philadelphia Inquirer dated from May 26th, 1855. And we're not going to read through the whole, the whole article, but it really talks about the majestic natural beauty of this particular location. And I did want to just pull out a couple of things, thinking about the incredible horticulture that exists at Mount Moriah today. This was very much on people's minds in 1855. Um, it, there's a quote, the forest trees lift their leaf crowned tops to the calm heaven above, the majestic oak, the graceful chestnut, the waving poplar, fragrant walnut, straight and stalwart hickory, trembling ash, and on and on. Leafy arching boughs and charm, they charm the visitor with their cooling shade. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that this was um, something that was quite remarkable and quite poetic in the way that it was written at the time. So when Mount Moriah Cemetery was incorporated in 1855 um, by an act of Pennsylvania State Legislature, um, it was known as the Mount Moriah Cemetery Association. That association still technically owns Mount Moriah Cemetery today, although there is no living member of that association. It was um, an association managed by um, a board of managers with a director, and the director was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. And from 1855 until around 2004, that um, director position was passed down, not necessarily in the same family, but among a group of families. And they are the people that owned and operated Mount Moriah Cemetery for um, that period of time. We'll talk a bit more about um, what that means that a defunct association still owns this cemetery uh, a bit later on. Um, but in 1855, they began the layout of those original sections. In 1856, the first burial was held on site, and they began selling plots in, in earnest from that point. Um, it was considered an ideal location, as Kate has pointed out. It was a beautiful creek valley. It was mostly farmland in this area of the city. Um, it was considered removed from the hustle and bustle of the central part of Philadelphia. Um, and much like um, the other Philadelphia peers, and, and of course Mount Auburn in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Mount Moriah was really aiming to be part of that rural cemetery movement. Um, advertising the space at not only as the final resting place for your loved ones, but somewhere to come spend time on the weekend, um, come have a picnic, tend for your family's plot, that sort of thing. Yeah, and you can see on the screen um, the proximity of Mount Moriah, the kind of first part of Mount Moriah that was incorporated um, to kind of that, that central, very iconic axis of City Hall in Philadelphia. And just to, to quote a newspaper article, the great advantage that this new cemetery has over all others in the vicinity of our city is its geographical position. Beyond the reach of brick walls and close-built streets, it is separated from the adjacent heights in the north and west only by the beautiful stream of water. So newspapers began to advertise Mount Moriah Cemetery's availability as a place where you could buy a plot for your family. They would run coaches um, from Center City to take people out to tour the grounds. There was a lawn and perpetual care plan that was planning for future growth at the time too. Um, and this is advertising that there were 150,000 people interred at the, at the cemetery. This was of course a, a business um, in addition to being a beautiful place for people to spend time, remember loved ones, and also recreate. There was expansion that was also happening close uh, after the turn of the century. Um, there were additions that were being included um, as expansion started to include some of the alpha sections that Jen had pointed out. This was the original part of the cemetery first incorporated. There were larger alpha sections, um, very kind of rectilinear in terms of their form and their structure as well. So they were doing well, the business was doing well. They acquired more, more land in that process. Um, 
So Mount Moriah Cemetery, of course, um, was seeking to attract wealthy families who would come in and, and build um, beautiful memorials to their loved ones. But unlike our peer cemeteries, Laurel Hill, East and West, and the Woodlands, Mount Moriah Cemetery was not trying to cater exclusively to wealthy clientele. So we do have, um, still existing today, a number of these um, beautiful family plots with large monuments or an obelisk. Um, but Mount Moriah Cemetery was also selling individual graves. And there are people of all types and all backgrounds buried here. It was non-denominational. Um, even in the latter half of the 1800s, there was quite a bit of, of diversity of the people who were being buried here. Um, and that continued up until the, the point the cemetery was closed. For about the last 20 years or so that the cemetery was in operation, uh, the largest group of, of people who were being buried at Mount Moriah Cemetery were Muslim. And there is currently no place inside the city of Philadelphia that allows Muslim burials today. Um, I'm going to... Sure. Your gen, I'll hand advance. it to you. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so, we mentioned a bit earlier uh, the gatehouse of the cemetery. So, this was the original entrance. This gatehouse was originally just a facade. It was built in 1855 by architect St Stephen Decatur Button, who is also responsible for some of the monuments at, at Gettysburg. He was well known at the time. Um, the facade was meant to be the grand entrance into the cemetery. And so a carriage arriving would um, travel up this road through the center um, and into the cemetery grounds. At some point, we're not exactly sure what year, likely um, around 1900 or so, um, on either side of the gatehouse facade in the back, they built caretakers' cottages, small houses uh, for the caretakers and their families. And we occasionally hear some stories from some of those children who are now in their 70s or 80s who, who grew up in uh, Mount Moriah. The area that you see in the front where this road was, at some point was turned into a burial section. So if you visit today, it's a little harder to see in this photo, but there are burials where there used to be a road here. Um, the gatehouse, when the cemetery was closed in 2011, was already in disrepair. There had been a fire in around 1970 or so in one of those cottages. Um, it caved in, the cottage caved in, and the facade itself is in, is in danger of crumbling. Um, it is on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places, and um, it's not possible to see in this photo here, but we do have some um, structures meant to keep this facade upright because it is tipping. And it is one of the things that the Friends of Mount Moriah would love to see the gatehouse fully restored. Unfortunately, it's a multi-million dollar project um, and not something that we are able to do at this point. Um, you have... oh, yeah, that's good. So um, we do have um, a small area on the Yaden side of the cemetery in Delaware County known as Mausoleum Hill because there is a cluster of mausolea there um, in a variety of, of styles and they are grouped on a hillside. It's just a beautiful sight as you enter the uh, Yaden side of the cemetery. Today, this is what it would have looked like in 2011-2012 that entire hillside was so overgrown, you could barely tell that there was any mausolea there. And some of them are quite large. Today, it's a, a beautifully cared for, regularly mowed area of the cemetery. Um, we also, another unique feature of Mount Moriah Cemetery is that there are two national cemeteries contained within the grounds of Mount Moriah Cemetery. So on the Philadelphia side, there's the very small Soldier's Rest, um, which is about 200 Civil War veterans. And on the Yaden side, there's the US Naval Asylum plot, um, the, 
the Naval Hospital had a small um, burial ground and they very quickly needed space and bought acreage at Mount Moriah. So despite the abandonment of the cemetery and the disrepair, the two national cemeteries have been cared for by the Veterans Administration this entire time. And you could enter the cemetery 10 years ago, walk through grass as, as tall as you were, and enter into one of the national cemetery areas. Um, every December, we participate in Reads Across America in, in this area and try and, and place as many wreaths for the veterans as we can. So just to kind of reorient us to the Kingsessing neighborhood, which is surrounding the Philadelphia side of the cemetery, um, the Kingsessing neighborhood's local economy never recovered from the departure of vital local industrial and manufacturing institutions and the job that they jobs that they provided. The neighborhood is it's a community. It's it's vibrant. There are, there are people that are living there. There are people that call this place home, um, but it is marked by widespread um, dilapidation and abandonment, um, though that, that's always somewhat in flux. Southwest Philadelphia and these parts of Southwest Philadelphia are some of the most economically disadvantaged neighborhoods in the city, and they also have some of the, the highest crime rates. Um, Medium home prices are, are low immediately across the street from the entrance on the Kingsessing Philadelphia side of the cemetery close to the office building. There are people actively living in row houses, but some of those row houses are abandoned and boarded up. And there is the active SEPTA trolley line and bus lines that are running down Kingsessing Avenue. And what you see on the, the lower part of the screen um, on the right side is actually a, a trolley turnaround that's right in front of the area um, that we just shared with you where the brownstone gatehouse is located. Over time, um, the cemetery did fall into significant neglect in terms of maintenance and public relations or have not been always good by any means. From dumping abandoned cars, um, dog fighting, abandoned animals, um, to tires strewn left and right, abandoned construction materials in which people who might be doing a job in Delaware County or Philadelphia would just drive into the cemetery quietly and unload a bunch of concrete in any given location. Um, this is something that is still something that we're working against having happen in the cemetery, but public relations did absolutely reach kind of a, a low point um, in terms of what was happening there with the dumping and real or perceived threats to safety in the cemetery. And in 2011, uh, the cemetery closed. Um, in March of tw or 2011, I'm sorry, in March of 2011, the Mount Moriah Cemetery Association ended all business operations. They walked away. The city of Philadelphia became aware of this after news reports and sis and phone calls. What you see on the screen right now is a photograph that was taken in June of 2011. And you can see a certain amount of those really tall, high grasses, Jen, that you just noted that would prevent you from accessing um, several most points within the cemetery. Yeah. Um, the Mount Moriah Cemetery Association, I mentioned that it was active in 2004, but as Kate just said, the cemetery closed in 2011. We're not entirely sure who was running cemetery operations for those seven years. The last owner died in 2004, and someone was running the cemetery, we guess an employee or a family member, um, but not someone who was technically part of the cemetery association which owned the cemetery. And so for those seven years, burials were happening. There was a burial the day before the gates were closed forever by the cemetery association. Um, and as you can imagine, families that uh, had loved ones buried here recently or had purchased a, a plot for the, themselves or other family members were shocked to learn that um, the cemetery had been abandoned. And a lot of people say, how is this even possible? How can you abandon a cemetery? Who's responsible? Why doesn't the city of Philadelphia just fix it and, and do something? Um, 
Because Mount Moriah exists in two places, in Philadelphia County and Delaware County, which is unique, there are not many cemetery properties that are in two different counties. And because the cities of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are not legally required to care for a defunct or abandoned cemetery or graveyard, the way most other um, places within the state of Pennsylvania are required to do so, there was nothing that would would force the city of Philadelphia to come in. We do get a lot of help from them, um, but they are not required to come in and, and act as owners. The cemetery came under the care of a receivership established by the Orphans Court of Philadelphia in 20, early 2014. And that receivership is held by a nonprofit organization called the Mount Moriah Cemetery Preservation Corporation which I have to say slowly because it's a mouthful. Um, that is the nonprofit that allows the Friends of Mount Moriah, also a, a, a nonprofit, to, to do the work that we do to care for the grounds. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a bit uh, about some of the future goals, but that receivership is in place to allow grass cutting, um, care for the trees, events and programming, and, and that sort of thing to happen. The Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery, there had been efforts to form a friends group even before the cemetery closed. We've heard reports um, from folks from the 1960s and 70s that this cemetery was not being well kept. Um, people would come to visit their loved ones and they'd find the grass was tall, and we're not just talking a couple inches um, tall, but things that looked more like um, the, the picture that Kate showed of that front gate. We've heard reports in the 80s and 90s of somebody coming to bury a loved one and the cemetery management would sort of mow a pathway to the plot. And if you can imagine attending a funeral where you have to walk along a mowed pathway in order to even access the area. So there were attempts to form friends groups um, prior to the cemetery closing in 2011. Um, I wasn't involved at that time, but I've heard that the uh, folks who were running the day-to-day -day operations at the cemetery were resistant to the idea of having a volunteer friends group. So the current iteration of the Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery began in 2011 uh, with just two or three people, a weed whacker or two, and a push mower. And if you can imagine walking into a space that had grass as tall as you were with a weed whacker and a push mower and it's nearly 200 acres, it, it, it seems like you're not even gonna make a dent um, in the, the amount of land. But the Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery has been going strong for over 10 years now. Um, we're an all-volunteer organization. There is no staff, there's nobody who's paid. Um, the organization is a, a board of managers and then a large group of volunteers who give their time to come mow the grass, um, give their time to re reset headstones, um, do research with the records, and of course, um, a number of, of generous donors that, that keep all of that work going. And, um, when we began in 2011, the initial strategy of how are we gonna approach this was to simply work from the two entry points to the cemetery on King Sessing Avenue and then on Cobbs Creek Parkway and try and push in from the entrances, thinking that if people were driving by on either of those streets, they could easily see from their cars that something was happening here after many decades of neglect. You can see on the, on the left side, um, we started producing a restoration map where we were working to color code which sections we had um, been able to um, reclaim um, and restore, and for us that is taking down all of the overgrowth and, and vegetation. Um, we have a big problem, like many places, with Japanese knotweed, which is incredibly invasive and, and hard to get rid of, but we started on, um, from those entrances, pushing inwards and started producing this map to show what was still overgrown, what it was overgrown with. Um, the map on the left, I know it's not possible to see that, um, legend, but we were marking um, sections that were primarily uh, knotweed, primarily honeysuckle, primarily some sort of invasive trees. We have a lot of 
uh, tree of heaven, the Atlantis trees that the spotted lanternflies love so much. Um, and then naturally, more volunteers started showing up, particularly families that had ancestors buried at Mount Moriah who said, well, I want to clear this particular section where my people are because I'm hoping I, at some point I might find a stone. And so the, the restoration efforts began to become a bit more of a patchwork as more people showed up to start volunteering. And so on the right-hand side, you can see the restoration map that we produced last year. The sort of greenish, bluish color is the sections that we've cleared and that are maintained which means there is a volunteer March, April through October, or sometimes November, if we have an October that is warm as this one has been so far, um, out there mowing on a weekly or, or, or twice a month basis. The ones that are color coded yellow are getting an annual cut. So you might um, visit tomorrow and find that one of those sections does have tall grass in it. It's because it's getting an annual cut. And we have always worked um, at what we consider a manageable pace. Since we're all volunteer, we have to be able to maintain what we've reclaimed. It makes no sense for us to clear cut a section of the cemetery down to grass if there's no plan for how to care for it and people and resources to, to continue the restoration. I will note too, there's a lot of information to take in on these, these two restoration maps and, and Jen went over really all of it. But if you want to compare with kind of a before and after, the image on the left in 2014, the green, the bright green and the darker green are areas that were either maintained or recently cut back. And so there's been a lot of ground that's been covered over the years to get to where we have recorded progress as of 2022 on the right. It's probably also worth mentioning that at the end of 2022, the board of the Friends of Mount Moriah Cemetery decided at least for the next year and perhaps into 2024, we were not going to clear any additional sections. We've reached the point where about 70% of those sections are cleared and maintained and we felt as though we couldn't keep going without taking a pause and a breather and making sure that we could continue to manage them and also think more about what those sections might look like in the future because the goal here is not to have a manicured golf course type cemetery. It's just not sustainable for, for this type of, of space in this group. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, I wanted to share some images of what the kind of wild vegetation in the cemetery and invasive species look like. So in the images that you see, you're seeing it, examples of poison ivy, paper mulberry, ailanthus trees, multiflora rose, rubus species, which are challenging because they have, they have thorns on them. Um, Porcelain berry, vinca, euonymus, um, burning bush, mile a minute weed, I mean, you name it, it has a field day at the cemetery, especially in areas that are sunny, that get these kind of edge conditions and which plants that are very rapidly spreading, very prolific in terms of their reproduction. They love sunny, nutrient poor conditions. There's a lot of that at Mount Moriah. And whenever a section is cleared, these invasive species can creep back in very, very quickly. And we have to be mindful of that. What you can't see in some of these images are the graves that are being top, just completely covered by this vegetation. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. So access to graves has been um, incredibly limited, um, though a priority has been maintaining access to graves so that visitors and loved ones can get to these very important um, sacred spaces. But it's, it's a challenge, and you're working with extremely heavy, um, unwieldy, in many cases, headstones. Um, there are many that have fallen, many that have needed to be repaired. Um, it is it is absolutely a challenge.
I wanted to speak a little bit about how we maintain these spaces, how we clear them, how we plant things that might be better for the ecosystem and for the visitor experience at Mount Moriah Cemetery. Um, and then some of these things have been student projects involving Temple University students led by me. I very proudly teach in our general education program at Temple University, some course offerings that have to do with green stewardship, urban ecology, the fundamentals of environmental science, and really getting students into the field so that they get a sense of what it takes to maintain a green space and practice green stewardship. So what you see kind of highlighted on the screen right here was a partnership project with the Audubon Society where we selected a, a, a plant palette of wildlife-friendly shrub species and had student volunteers plant them. We caged them. They're in the Circle of St. John area in um, Section 37, and they're still there to this day. They're doing well. The deer like them. We've uncaged many of them. Um, but this is an example of some of the kind of experimentation that we've done in terms of planting in some more open or cleared areas. From physically planting and practicing stewardship on site and volunteering, um, there have also been design studio projects in which uh, a senior level Bachelor of Landscape Architecture design studio working with their professor, Lolly Tai, did a you know, massive like master plan and redesign for certain sections of the cemetery. They presented this work at the Municipal Services Building in Philadelphia. They created a book of their design proposals, which is fantastic. It's a hard copy of, of a book. Um, and this is another, kind of an, an, another end of the spectrum example of academic involvement and engagement that is also service work. And then we see some examples of native shrub planting in areas very close to um, the, the military plots that are near to Cobbs Creek, um, the creek itself and the parkway, and other just examples of experimentation and test plants to seed different ground covers that might do well in some of these very sunny edge conditions that don't have canopy coverage. I want to point out and just give a shout out to this person right here. This is Paulette Roan. We'll talk a little bit more about Paulette in a moment. But this spirit of service, this spirit of urban ecology, this spirit of experimentation, this experimentation uh, in, in terms of gardening, of trying anything to see if it might work, she was really a, a driving force and factor um, behind that. And then we get to some of the very beautiful intentional horticulture that we have at the cemetery, from magnolia trees to Japanese um, maples to some of the biggest boxwoods and yews and cedars that I've ever seen anywhere in my entire life. Um, there is a lot of intentional horticulture that you can find at Mount Moriah that we are, it's very important for us to maintain. I'll talk a little bit more about um, our arboretum status in a moment. And there it is, and we are certified by ARBNET, um, which is based at the Morton Arboretum in Illinois. We are an ARBNET level one cemetery, and we're incredibly proud of this. We received our certification as a level run arboretum in 2016. We've been recertified. Um, we're a level one arboretum like your own Tanger Arboretum here in Lancaster, which means we have an arboretum plan, we have an organizational group, we have a, a collection that's over 150 trees. Um, we have a staff of volunteers that helps to maintain these trees. And we do have a public dimension to our arboretum. Um, the public can access these trees at any time. They're free to enjoy them on our grounds. There are associated events and educational programming that accompany our arboretum as well. And we've got maples, we've got hollies, we've got black walnut, we have cedar, oak, sassafras, um, and some examples of these different species of trees that people, um, including horticulturists just haven't seen anywhere else outside of Mount Moriah. And we're doing smaller scale projects in terms of planting too. We had a, a wonderful article that was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer last year that took a closer look at some of these 
projects within um, PLOTS, uh, Micro Meadows Project, which was initiated by Joe Cosgrove, who is our chair of the Arboretum and Green Committees here at Mount Moriah. And the idea was to kind of cover everything with cardboard, start all over again, and plant very pollinator-friendly species in these locations milkweed, butterfly weed, a variety of different herbaceous species, and to allow some of these places to be wild in terms of their vegetation within the kind of stricter structure of the plot itself. And it's, it's working well. We have grave gardeners also, um, which is something that we kind of share with the Woodland Cemetery, in which volunteers um, use uh, plant plants in smaller plots and maintain them, adding some color and some joy here and there in terms of the plantings at the cemetery. So I realize um, Kate and I are, are very quickly running out of time and yeah. we want to make sure that there is a bit of time um, before you all need to head home um, for some questions. I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move as quickly as possible. Um, the Friends of Mount Moriah did a strategic plan in 2018 with Fairmount Ventures and um, some other folks in the, on the project team to sort of figure out what the vision for this space could be. And um, this was about eight years after um, the cemetery was abandoned. Um, I refer to it as um, previously abandoned um, property, but we knew that this space could be a great um, ecological and educational resource for Southwest Philadelphia and Yaden. It is the largest green space, certainly, in Southwest Philadelphia, um, and is, is an important resource to the community. Um, that, see, we go. Um, that strategic plan set one of the main priorities as securing new ownership for Mount Moriah Cemetery. Mount Moriah will never be an operational cemetery with new burials again, at least not in a traditional manner, because the records are not complete. There are no plat maps that indicate exactly where each individual is buried. And so that does not make the cemetery um, an attractive option for one of the larger cemetery companies that you see buying up spaces across the country. Um, so it is most likely going to be a, a nonprofit that steps in and takes ownership. And along with that goal, one of the things that was outlined in that strategic plan is that the Friends of Mount Moriah at some point will move out of the business of doing all of the things, the landscaping, the headstone resetting, the education, programming, events, all of the day-to-day -day operations, and will become more of a traditional Friends group that has some, some very focused responsibilities. We lost Paulette Roan, um, who's really our, our North Star and continues to be in 2019 very, very suddenly. Um, having just traveled to Mount Auburn Cemetery with Jen, having just talked with me about beavers in urban areas along creeks through email the night before, Paulette, who was the president of the board um, from its inception, was no longer with us, which has been incredibly challenging. We've had great leadership since then. Vice President Ken Smith um, stepped in and, and became president, a role that Jen now serves in. But I, I think that we, we think about everything we do in terms of what Paulette would have wanted um, because we value her so highly, but also because she just had a fantastic vision for what this place um, would become and has become. And before she passed, she saw a strategic planning process through that was years in the making, and she saw us gain that Arboretum Level 1 status, which was a, a passion project of hers. We're very, very thankful to have her commemorated um, on a plaque um, on King Sessing Avenue that is um, renaming the street Paulette Roan Way. And Paulette was the first person buried at Mount Moriah Cemetery since it closed in 2011. So um, people who own space at the cemetery can petition the Orphans Court of Philadelphia for the right to inter. And Paulette's two children, um, when she passed away unexpectedly, said, 
It's important for our mom to be with her dad, and we are going to go through the process of petitioning the court, um, which takes, uh, it's a court. You, you hire a lawyer, you file a petition, it can take weeks or months to get approval. Um, they did, and so Paulette was the first person buried at Mount Moriah. There's been one other since then, so it is something that people who own plots are, are thinking about doing. Um, and then just very briefly, we, we wanted to, to end by talking about sort of some of the, the new life and new things happening at Mount Moriah Cemetery. In addition to, to things like the, the cradle grave project and the office building restoration, the Friends of Mount Moriah volunteers over the last particularly five years or so have really started getting more involved in not just planning cleanup and restoration days where we invite people to um, come put some work gloves on and do some landscaping work, but also, as I mentioned, participating in Reads Across America and other types of events, including <clears throat> one that is sometimes a little contra controversial. Um, for the last four years, we have held oops, a market, Halloween market, uh, a maker's market. So it's artists um, who, who make everything from clothing to jewelry. It's all sort of Halloween themed. Um, we don't run the market. We partner with um, somebody who, who manages that. We were approached in 2019 and asked if we would host this. And um, we know that this can be a little controversial for some. This market is our largest single fundraiser every year. So in 2022, we raised over $8,000 in a single day, which is for a group our size, a significant portion of our budget. And we're actually holding this market again this coming Saturday, October 7th, as long as it doesn't rain, which it may. And then I think we should just yeah we, we can wrap up. we can wrap up if yeah. anyone has any questions about where we plan to go from here we have a couple of slides about that um, but we'd love to hear from you any questions or comments I know that we don't have a lot of time but we'd like to like to get to those and thank you all very much for your attention. All right, so any burning questions? I see one here, and I'll walk around with the microphone to give you questions so, you, so everybody will be able to hear you at home. Can you share the names of any famous Philadelphians that are buried there? Oh, gosh, so the most famous is Betsy Ross, who you, you may have heard made the, the first flag. Um, so Betsy Ross is an interesting one because she was originally buried at the Free Quaker Cemetery in Philadelphia. I'm forgetting the exact year she died. Um, <laughs> She was moved to Mount Moriah Cemetery along with her third husband and at least one grandchild in, I believe, 1864. And um, right before the <clears throat> 1974, 1975, her descendants actually petitioned the Orphans Court of Philadelphia to have her moved to the new Betsy Ross House in Old City. And at the time, we have some, some letters um, from the cemetery management to the Orphans Court of, of Philadelphia in 1975, um, the cemetery believed that um, the desire to move Betsy Ross was a farce. I mean, they said she's been gone for so long, there is nothing to move. There was a week-long archeological dig at the cemetery because the Orphans Court granted permission. Um, the archeologist that was responsible for that was having trouble finding Betsy Ross. Um, I saw somebody raise their hand. Were you the archeologist? <laughs> um, and so some, some portion of, of her remains were believed to, to be moved. Other than that, there are no names I could give you that are just immediately everybody in the room would know. Yeah, the, 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 the Bassett's ice cream, Bassett yeah. family has a plot there. So we have a, a day that kind of commemorates that connection with ice cream at the cemetery and their, their connections here and there. And people who have fought as far back as the War of 1812, Jen? There's, well, there's actually uh, revolution soldiers yep. that were reburied at Mount Moriah, um, moved from the First Baptist um, uh, graveyard in Philadelphia. All right, so our question over here. Uh, hi, um, you had mentioned uh, regarding a national military cemetery. Is that part of Mount Moriah? 
It, and yeah. if so, does the federal government have any responsibility to provide funding, operational support, or anything like that? So, yes, there are two national cemeteries contained within Mount Moriah Cemetery, um, the, and they're taken care of by the Veterans Administration, but there's no requirement beyond them taking care of the area of ground that is theirs. Um, so that is not a potential source um, for caring for the rest of the cemetery. Thank you for 12 years of amazing work at Mount Moriah. I look forward to visiting. Um, my name is John Hershey and Kate, I'm also a registered landscape architect with a passion for history. I serve on the vestry here at St. James. I live next door to an old cemetery in Strasburg Borough as well. Uh, two questions. Oh, and by the way, in case you were wondering, we provided dead flowers for a backdrop just to sort of fit the, the theme for this evening. Um, They're lovely. I like them. Thank two qu questions, one for each of you. I think you mentioned the architect who designed the gatehouse, but I didn't hear if the site plan itself is attributed to any particular designer who uh, created that man-made topography and the carriage paths and fencing and so forth. And the second question, uh, you mentioned some of the perceptions of safety and security in the area. And I was curious as to how you balance that with native shrub plantings that could potentially over time create hiding places and concerns for safety and security. That's something that we're wrestling with here in, in our understory planting as we try to go beyond just lawn and mulch in, in many of the churchyard areas. Yeah, two very good questions. The, the answer to the first one, we do not know. Um, mm -hmm. I do not know the, the original designer of the cemetery and some of those plans that one would love to have in their hot little hands for something like a cultural landscape report haven't been able to find those either. We have maps, right? We have maps, but the design plans, not identifiable. Many, many records that have been waded through that were left behind in that uh, office building. But those materials, such a rich body of research that I would love yeah. to have, it hasn't been uncovered, um, unfortunately. Um, the second question, there are a few shrub plantings that take place, I think, overall, and they're strategically located in areas where safety is not of high concern, I would say, is a very broad answer to that question. Jen, if you'd but, like to. But I, I would yeah. also say, compared to 200 acres that were so overgrown, you could disappear in there. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we haven't really thought much about that um, because uh, at the point that the cemetery was abandoned, there was a lot of illegal activity happening in there because it was so overgrown, it was easy to not be seen. Um, even as we've worked to clear it, I've, I've walked through Mount Moriah and forgotten that I'm in the middle of the city. Um, so we haven't really put too much thought at, at this point towards those, those types of, you know, how might that affect um, safety on, on the grounds. Questions are Cordelia, how are we on time? Do we need to be out of here? Okay, great, I saw a hand over here. I'm Jean Weglars, I'm president of the Woodward Hill Cemetery Board, which is a historic cemetery here in Lancaster. Only 32 acres, I almost passed out when you said 200 acres. Um, we are thinking about forming a friends group. We are an operational cemetery formed originally by Trinity Lutheran Church. Do you have a 501c3 chair for, okay. You did yep. not say that and I thought, yeah. how so, could you possibly not? All right, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and if, any, if anybody does need to leave, feel free to head out. Hi, my name's Kate. Um, I'm wondering where the origin of the name King Sessing came from, that mm. street. Oh man, I think it, <laughs> so it, it's a Swedish origin, I believe. Um, so way back when, family name, as far as I know, but King Sessing dates very far back there, um, I believe, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't be any more descriptive <laughs> about that one, yeah. But it nods to Swedish settlers. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Williams, I'm, I'm a member of St. James. Um, I just want to say thank you for all your work. My uh, great-grandparents are buried in Section 57, and I did some work in there in the kind of the Wild West days, 
And I had one practical question. Um, uh, they're in an unmarked plot, and I, I don't think I can add a marker there anymore. You, anymore? you can, or? actually. So um, the orphans, the, the terms of the receivership, the receiver um, made the decision about a year and a half ago that the terms of the receivership would allow us to mark a grave that is not currently marked as long as it is a private grave. Um, that doesn't mean there couldn't be a, a two members or whatever the same family, but Mount Moriah did have non-private graves where two unrelated individuals might be buried together. So as long as it's private um, and we can confirm the correct location, we can um, work with you and an outside monument company of your choosing to have it marked. Um, okay. Please, please contact us. If you, if you email us, I can give you a card. You'll, you'll get me and I'm happy to help. Yeah, thanks. I have one other question. Are they still keeping bees? <laughs> yes. Oh, the the yeah. yeah. So the, that's really cool. Yeah. So um, the Philadelphia Bee Company has um, a number of hives at the cemetery. Yeah. Now I should really quickly, if it's okay, Mabel, go back and correct myself that sure. while King Sissing was settled by Swedish settlers, to my knowledge, the name Ching Sissing is Delaware. It's indigenous, and it means of the meadow. So um, it's, it's highly appropriate to um, connect back to kind of where we're at today in this particular place. Thanks. Any last questions? <laughs> Do you have any insights on any, uh, any varieties of historical trees on the property? Oh, um, the question, nice. what trees? What, what, sorry, can you repeat the question? I apologize. Oh, the age, oh. my gosh. Very old, over 100 years. Um, some that have been around for up to a century or so. Um, we have some of the oldest examples of boxwood that we have ever seen, where it's really tree-sized and no longer shrub-sized there. I, I apologize, I wish Joe Cosgrove was here because she would be able to say, like, we have one grand state champion X, X tree. Um, but we, I believe, Jen, we can share any of the information about our collections. Um, and, and I do want to give a quick shout out to Heather Caustic, who's a biologist at Drexel University, who was the person with her student team, she was a PhD candidate at Drexel, who identified all of these trees for us. It was her expertise um, and her students' expertise working on a project to monitor um, insects at the cemetery and counts of insects, looking at various cemeteries across Philadelphia um, to kind of gauge where insects most robust in terms of amount of biomass that can be collected. Mount Moriah, high up there, if not highest, um, but it's her work that really um, made the publication of our collections possible. Um, and, and is part of our ARBnet status, so we thank her. Any final questions? Well, first of all, I want to thank our, thank our speakers. I think I have one more before we'll wrap up. Was the Masonic section set up by the uh, Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania? I believe it was the Grand Lodge. Um, it's my understanding that it was laid out in a very particular way. Um, as, as far as the sort of the quadrants of the circle and the center monument, I believe it was the, the do, Pennsylvania. Do they still support it or is it just kind of? We've had a variety of um, local Masonic lodges offering support um, throughout the, the process, particularly helping to clear that section um, and reset the stones there and maintain it. All right, so once again, I just want to thank Kate and Jen and really encourage folks to go. It's a really amazing place that bring, where, you know, makes you think about the people who are buried there and makes you think about all the 100, 150 years of stuff of people who have been going there and being buried there and who are now using the space. Um, so I do really encourage everyone to go out there if you get a chance. Uh, so otherwise, just join me in thanking Kate and Jen so much for joining us and thanking Cordelia and all of St. James for hosting us. Uh, thank, thank you so much. And I'm sure if anyone has questions, they're happy to yeah. pass out business cards and be in touch. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go grab some of those. Thank you all very much.